Fence Marketing Profit Podcast. Interviews with million-dollar-plus fence and gate business owners on how they market and grow their companies in today's economy. Hear directly from the most successful leaders in your business and discover what they're doing to keep their phones ringing, trucks running, and businesses booming with your host, Scott Andreessen. Okay. So we are live and... People are starting to show up. This is awesome. What's up, Eric, Jeff, John? Wow. Uh, we actually have more than three people. Joe, Joe, Joe Sue. Boy, I know I'm crushing your name. Sorry, bro. Joe. <laughs> I'll say Joe Espino. What's up, man? Uh, Rachel's there. Hey, Rachel. How you doing? Um, cool. So people are trickling in. And uh, folks, we're going to get started in just a moment. I'm with uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Sean King of Mr. Fence out of Evansville. And uh, we're going to get going here soon, but we're just going to give people maybe another 20, 30 seconds to uh, head on in. So stay tuned. We're not going anywhere, but don't leave. If you got to take a potty break, you know, don't do that. You don't have enough time for that, but uh, we are going to start very soon. We should probably go ahead and get into it, don't you think? It's go for it. It's twelve on the clock. Do we want to give people another another minute? I'd say give another minute. We'll give them another minute. They're fence guys. Girl. We got someone here on the phone. Don't know exactly who that is, but hello to you, sir or miss. Thanks for joining us. So I, I think we can go ahead and yeah, we can go ahead and start, Sean. Let's um Let's go ahead. Before we start, let's put the caveat out there that this is my first webinar, so be easy with me, right? <laughs> I don't know what everybody expects. I'm not a genius with this stuff. i got a lot to learn on my own. Uh, by no means am I going to give you the secret potion and formula today, but uh, we're going to talk about fence. And fence. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you told me you were going to tell these people how to make $3 million on this webinar. What happened that, to that? That's what I'm going to The caveat is uh, we're going to talk about it. I don't have a solution. I'm uh, not a genius. Still All right. A lot to learn. All right. So we're we're gonna get into it. Um, Dan, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and and get started. Sean King, Mr. Fence, out of Evansville, Indiana. Sean, uh, please tell everyone a bit about your background and your business, total revenues, things like that. Okay. So like most fence guys grew up in the fence industry as a very young age, around eight years old, following my stepdad around, uh, picking up trash and, and just being in, engulfed in the fence industry at a very young age. Uh, at the young age of 16, I uh, worked in this in uh, running crews during the summer. I think I started about 16 years old running my own crew and then it graduated high school, started running multiple crews and just getting engulfed in the fence business as I grew. Um, out of high school. So I was supposed to go to college, didn't do that. Uh, just got stuck in the trenches building fence. Um, and here it is. Uh, let's see, I'm 40 now. So about almost 30 years, uh, in, uh, digging holes. So wow. that period of time we, uh, had the family business. Um, I took over the family business in 2000 at the time of taking that over. We were at a revenue of about 800,000 to 950 pretty consistently. So the years from 97 to 2000, that's the size of the company that I took over. That's the size of the business that I started operating with zero experience in business. I knew how to build a fence. But that was about it. Definitely didn't know how to manage people. Wasn't very well good at communication with people. That's one of the biggest things I've learned. So I started my own fence company, clo closed down the, uh, the, the family business, Dossett & Sons, mainly because the name Dossett & Sons doesn't bring – um, awareness of what it is we do. Um, so I had a license plate on my truck. The license plate said Mr. Fence. So we ran with Mr. Fence. So 2001 to 2003, started that Mr. Fence company with Dossett and Sons. Um, and I was by, you know, owned that by myself. There was no family members left in that business. They had all moved on, done other things. Um, so at a very young age of 20, early 20s with married and a child and trying to figure out how to run a business made wow. a lot of mistakes a lot of mistakes in the first 10 years 
Uh, that cost me quite a bit of uh, time and money. But at the end of the day, I'm going to share with you guys some things that I learned through that process. And maybe it might help you or it might prevent you from making those mistakes. Some of you might just relate because you've probably done the same thing. And uh, I'm hopefully going to share with you some of my successes, most of which could be by accident. I'm not going to say that I have a secret potion. I've learned some of this stuff by luck and also the hard way. So from when I, when I started uh, really cranking Mr. Fence, let's call it 2006 or so, which was no longer Dotson and Sons, just, just Mr. Fence, our revenue was about a million. So, so we, we, we just couldn't do, no matter what I did in the company, it was about a million dollars, 1.1, 900,000, uh, you know, tried all kinds of different ideas, tried different um, uh, revenue streams, not away from Fence alone decks and room additions and just whatever I could do, try to get into to add some more revenue in there. Um, it wasn't until we started seeing massive growth was about 2014. 2014. So, so eight years, what, uh, what transpired that, you know, catapulted you past the million to, you know, over three. Yeah. So we're worth at 3 million mark now. Um, and, and we've got there, we've been there consistently for the last two or three years. We're close to 3 million, just a share under, and now we're, we're at it. I think the biggest difference I'll share with you guys, uh, this is what here, I'm going to put, tells you this, what gets measured improves. I wrote this down just to make sure I, but this is what we started talking about in our business. What gets measured improves, what gets measured and reported improves exponentially. And what I mean by that is right about the 2013, 14 area, um, reluctantly, I, I hired a business coach. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine was recommending him, was doing great for him. And I, and, and I reluctantly hired him because the guy had no fence experience. And how was the guy coming here and help me run a fence business? I thought I already knew everything that I needed to know about how to run the business. I just needed to perfect it. And what I realized was he didn't bring anything new to the table. He didn't teach me anything I didn't already know. What he did do was it was this little bit of accountability that came into play. I knew I had a meeting with my business coach on Fridays afternoon. And I knew during that meeting we were going to talk about gross margins and gross profits and markups. And we were going to talk about buying and we we're going to talk about hiring. We were going to talk about business. And if I showed up to the meeting unprepared without my data, measured data, I'm going to look like, well, I'm prepared. And, and, and uh, so what I started doing was I started doing the things that I knew that I should have already done as a business owner. We all know that we should be tracking these things and we should be watching our business. And, mm -hmm. um, but we don't do them because there's no one else holding us accountable. So if we don't do that, there's no one looking over our shoulder saying, Hey, you didn't do the profit and loss report on that. Hey, have you come up with a game plan for this yet? There's no one really policing that piece. And so just by having him involved and, and having a, a sounding board, an idea, that's really where the, the growth started happening. And it wasn't necessarily because I hired a business coach. It was necessarily because I started focusing on the business. And so to put that another way, I like to look at business, or I like to describe to you this way, get out of the driver's seat of your company. You gotta get out of the driver's seat. And what I mean by that is, and it's, it's tough to do, is literally get out of the driver's seat and think of your company like a remote control car. And you hold the remote, but you can globally look down and see the car, everything around the car, behind the car, in front of the car. You can't really see what's going on inside the car, but you hold the control. So you navigate the car, and if you focus on global navigation, the bigger picture about planning, and you're not stuck in the driver's seat looking at the roadway hazard right in front of you and trying to make an invasive maneuver, you can so essentially by that you mean like work on your business but not in your business right we've all heard that and what does that mean i mean i know that for years i was told i went to seminars i went to classes and they would say that I'm like what is that i am working on my business i'm out here digging holes today i'm putting this fence in that's short term guys that's going to get that fence built but that doesn't get you any further that's that's what i was doing and that's why i was stuck at one million because there was no forecasting and global planning and paying attention to what gets measured improves what gets measured and reported improves exponentially across the all business so get out of the driver's seat drive it like a remote control car put somebody else in the driver's seat 
and be okay with the fact that there's going to be a delay in reaction. So when you, you tell that car, I want you to go right, that car has to, you have to communicate that to the driver, the driver has to tell the car, the car's going to go right. And sometimes it doesn't happen fast enough and you miss a turn. And now we're going down another road. Now we have to reevaluate and replan. It's nobody's fault but you as an owner. You didn't forecast enough time to give that command to turn the car mm -hmm. before the turn to allow them to make the turn. So now you have to suffer the consequences. And it might be now you're up all night trying to figure out another solution. Maybe you're up all weekend long trying to find another plan or you missed that opportunity. But at the end of the day, it comes down to you have to be able to take time to forecast and plan. Give the commands in enough time that the car can react and, and, and understand that there is a reaction period. You're not driving the car. If you were driving the car, you can immediately turn right, left, hit the brakes, hit the gas. But getting out of the business, there's a delayed reaction. So I like it. That makes I'm, sense. So tell, um, and, and by the way, guys, um, I want to say a shout out to Weston Peterson. How you doing? Um, you guys, if you have questions, there's a little chat box down below that you can start sending those in and a question answer box. I, I think the last bit of this, um, this webinar was Sean. I want to open it up to you guys so you can start asking him questions about your business. Um, that'd be okay with you, right, Sean? I'm okay with it, but uh, like, I'm, again, I'm not a genius at this stuff. I'm just going to share with you what I've found that worked for me. So how many, how many crews do you have right now? What is that? kind of overall operation look like? Currently we have uh, five crews, um, one of which is currently in Florida, has been in Florida working for months. Actually, actually we had th two or three crews over the winter, but right now we have four crews dedicated back home, one crew in Florida, and we are putting on a, f um, a fifth crew here in a week. Um, I don't know if anyone followed my Facebook page, but we are building a monster fence truck um, brand new with all the ingenuities and technology I can dream of in this truck and we're bringing on a crew to put in that truck. So we're going to have five crews here in no time um, and probably a sixth crew another two or three weeks after that. Now Chris and Rachel both, that, both asked the question, you know, how many people do you have in a crew? Two man crews, how many people? So we run three men, man crews. Um, one of them has a female on it, so I have to be careful how I say that. Three people crews. Uh, traditionally, we, we try to keep one crew flexible where it be a two man crew. Cause there's just some jobs that are smaller in nature and it doesn't make sense to have the three teams, um, uh, or the three people on that crew. It's more cost effective and more efficient to have two, but generally we run three and we have floater, um, laborers that we will, uh, give to a three man crew to give them the fourth guy. So to give you a instance, let's talk about that for a minute, that we have structured all of our crews with a foreman position, and then we have a co-foreman position, and then we have an installer position, that's the core three-person team, and then we have in our company called a laborer's position. And we got different criteria and testing for those positions and knowledge that they have to know, but and different pay, obviously the labor is the lowest pay, and those guys are mainly grunts or moving material, uh, gophers type things, we throw those on project that are a little bit larger than a three-man crew can do in a day, but we sure as heck don't want to send that three-man crew back a second day if we can add eight more man hours to it. We track everything by man hours, so if we sell a job for 32 man hours, we put that fourth guy out there that I can get done in one day. Um, we got to work with that turnover. We don't want to turn a, a job into two days if it's not a 48-hour man hour job. We would rather get it done in one day. So hopefully that answers the question. We have four positions, generally three on a team. Uh, sometimes we have a two-man crew, and then we have a full-time shop foreman. He has a laborer with him, and then we have a maintenance foreman. His full-time job is to uh, maintain our augers, equipment, trucks, uh, tools, inventory. And just There's maintenance every single day as well as repairs. Excellent. All right, good questions, guys. Appreciate that. Um, let's shift gears a little bit, Sean. And let's talk a little bit about your, your, your customer avatar, your, your target market that you go after. Uh, can you kind we of uh, unpack that for a residential us? residential-based company. I, let me share that first. So residential installs, that's where you hear about the one-day install, uh, might make a little more sense because we're not doing large commercial projects. We do do large commercial products. What's that? 
I'm sorry, we, I think we broke up a sec. So you said residential? So mainly residential. That's our, primarily, our primar, primary focus. We're talking about wood, aluminum, vinyl, um, and residential chain link. That is our bread and butter. That is what we do. I would say close to 90% of our fence installs is residential homeowner backyard projects. The crew in Florida is a commercial crew. I mean, they're putting in miles of chain link fence down there. Um, we off and on do some larger commercial projects here, but that is not our primary business focus. And as I share these ideas with you guys, you got to understand that these ideas are um, really focused towards my business model being a residential backyard, our trucks are set up for that, our crews are trained for that. Mm -hmm. um, we would be a fish out of water uh, back home doing miles of chain link fence and backstops and guardrails. And we, we do those every now and then. We have a gate operator division as well. We have one guy that's dedicated to gate operators, um, commercial and residential, but that, that's kind of our structure. Our customer base is typically, um, I would like to say the value of the home in our area is probably 200,000 to a, to a four or $500,000 home is our, is our primary customer. Um, here. So our average contract sale, we just had this data given to us yesterday. Um, here recently is about a $5,600 job. $5,692 I think is our average sale mm -hmm. um, and for the month of April. Uh, we hit our sales goals for April and the average sale was uh, $5,692. So it gives you an idea of the size of projects. Um, we, we, are, we are absolutely the most expensive, highest priced fence contractor than my competition in my competitive area. Um, we are generally just a touch higher than everyone else, but in my area, there's nobody that has a facility like we have with a showroom, um, outdoor displays, drive up traffic. Most of the guys are on pickup trucks working out of a, their home or a, um, a shed or a storage facility, something like that. That's the majority of my competition. I think that's really important. What you just touched upon there is um, you're, you're paying yourself first. You're, you're including profit um, because they're getting peace of mind with you. Right. They're, you know, that's why they're not going to go with the guy in a truck. And I talk about that with our customers. I talk about with our salesmen. I mean, when they walk in our showroom and see our showroom and see our outdoor display and see our trucks and our reputation, that costs something. And I quite frankly tell the homeowner like that, yeah, you're, we're $200 higher, we're $1,000 higher. That $1,000 is everything you see around you. It's the insurance, the workers' comp, the fact that we're going to answer the phone, the fact that there's four people in the office taking care of this. I have field superintendents and general managers. The fact that we are training our employees or the fact that our crews are going to show up with $100,000 of equipment, including the truck, to build your $5,000 fence. Compare that to a competition that might show up with a broken hammer and a wore out saw and an ax to build your fence out of a broke down pickup truck leaking oil out front. That's going to cost you less money, but at the end, which would you rather have? I can show them value why we have earned the extra difference in the cost. Yep. Um, we got a question here from Jay Houseright, um, which kind of bring, brings us right into where I wanted to go with this. So, to get that kind of growth, you're obviously doing marketing. Uh, Jay says, you know, sales and quality aren't his issue. Quality leads are. Now, he's in Dallas, Fort Worth, and they did about 850 k last year with um, one three-man crew, mostly residential. How did you market your business to get to that $3 million in sales? So can you kind of unpack your marketing mix for everybody? Let me share with you with you, um, the truck you see over my head right now, I have that on a big poster in my office because that in 2001 is when I bought that truck, um, that transition, put the Mr. Fence on the plate. I like lifted trucks. Just no reason, just like lifted trucks. Mm -hmm. so I lifted my work truck in 2002, I mean, it was 2003, it was a Silverado crew cab pickup truck with a utility bed on it, lifted it, put like six inch lift on it. And Mr. Fence all over it. And the only reason why I did it, guys, wasn't because of publicity or I thought marketing. It was just because I wanted it. What happened was people started recognizing that truck. But then we put smokestacks on it. And then we took it to the 4-H show. And then we started and – then, and then the lift kit went from 6 inches to 12 inches because if anyone on here has ever lifted a truck, you can't stop once you start. It's just addictive. You want to go bigger. So bigger tires and bigger truck. And then more publicity. And now, remember – 
I'm not buying radio ads or TV ads or newspaper ads. And I was actually off a beaten path. I didn't even have a good storefront, but this truck was running around town. And because I use it as my personal truck, my business truck, it was running around everywhere. And in about 2006, we were really, really known as the guys with the big trucks. So we got another one that matched this one and lifted it. And then we got another one and lifted it. Well, then we lifted our other two trucks. And pretty soon, and we lifted a Suburban, my wife's car. We lifted it and put hot pink underneath it. All of a sudden now, like, people were calling the office. And I'm, they would literally, we'd answer the phone, hello, this is Mr. Fence. And they would say, are you guys the ones with the great big trucks? Yes. Great. I need a fence estimate. Like, it has anything to do with that our is Awesome. That is awesome. I love it. But it was by mistake. It was being thrifty and that I could not afford radio, TV, newspaper, nor had no knowledge of how to do it. Facebook wasn't around. Instagram, none of that stuff was around. It just happened by going out, PR, it was a mistake. It just accidentally. But what it has led me to believe, I don't have all those lifted trucks anymore. There's too much maintenance and time, and it was, it was a lot of work. I was night and day working on those things. <laughs> but I, I will tell you, it was, we are still known for having trucks. The one behind me in that picture, that's a chrome we wrapped the truck completely in chrome. Well, now we just wrapped the 2019 in chrome. We just wrapped the Ford Fiesta in chrome. We're wrapping a F550 in chrome. You've got to find something that's signature that's going to stand out. And what happened was people recognized our trucks, and some liked it, and some did not. I did have some people tell me that's ridiculous and a waste of money, and I'm not going to buy a fence from you because you're wasting your money. That happened. But and we also had people at stoplights who give me a thumbs up, and some people would shake their head and go, "What in the world?" But at the end of the day. They saw me and they recognized the truck. Whether they liked it or not, they were talking about it. It was yeah. so much that my competition ran some radio ads and said on the radio ads, buy fence from me, because if you buy fence from Mr. Fence, you're just buying another fence part, or another truck part. What he said. Our phones ran off the hook. People said, hey, I heard your fence commercial. We never ran a radio commercial. But by him just talking about the fence truck and buying a part, they didn't hear that piece. They just heard Mr. Fence in the truck. So that was the biggest thing I did by accident was the trucks. We got the note, we got, we got known that way. Now what we do, obviously the trucks, we have a storefront that has over 30,000 people driving by and we have beautiful displays out front. Spent a lot of time and money into the displays. We have a 10 foot digital sign out there. It's a TV screen. We run all sorts of information across that. We yeah. also have a giant truck like the one above me in the air above the 10 foot TV screen. It's life-size truck hanging up there um, just to get people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, we do do a lot of uh, now Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we do uh, a ton of SEO work. Learned this several years ago that to get that funnel full for my sales team, you know, our capture ratio is in the 30 to 45% range depending nice. on the product that we're talking about. In order to get that capture ratio, you need the leads. Like he's asking, how do we get more leads and quality leads? Yeah, Jeff, well, I want to just make sure we address this question since we're on the topic. Jeff uh, Matsky, what's up, Jeff? Uh, he says the majority of his business is generated through his website. Can you speak a little about what you do on your website to generate traffic? So having a stagnant website, I've learned, I'm not an expert at this, but what I understand this to be is – um, archaic. We've had that before. We just build a website, put it up there, and you're done with it. That doesn't work. That 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 will not get you leads. It needs to be interactive and intuitive. They got to be able to hit a button right away and make contact. That's got to be easy to find. Um, Katie Weaver, I don't know if she's on here, but she, she recently told me you have literally five seconds, five seconds from the moment they hit your website for them to make a decision whether they're going to do something with that data in front of them or move on. And I, I can attest that I am that way. When I'm searching for something, yeah. I'm on websites. If I don't find what I'm looking for, I get frustrated in 10 seconds and I'm gone. If there's too much data and too much stuff to read through, sometimes I'm doing it on my phone, I'm out, I'm gone. So you've got to be have a website that's intuitive and interactive. You've got to be able to make contact right away. It could be schedule the estimate. It could be just make phone ring. It could be a contact page. Hey, email me back or call me back. That's very important. But here's the next thing, the SEO work. Search engine optimization. Right. You live and die by that. I'm telling you, your ranking on Google, you got to pay to play. There's no way you're throwing up a stagnant website that you made a deal on for 1500 bucks or 2000 or even $5,000 and throw it up there and think you're going to play. That's not going to work. I tried it multiple times. I've built multiple websites and paid 5000 3000 And I've also done and paid SEO work for multiple different companies. So I've, I've tried 
and had succeeded with a couple and have lost my butt with some other ones where mm -hmm. it has to be policed too. If you just yeah. pay somebody for SEO work and you don't get involved and learn what they're talking about, they're just going to charge you money and you're probably not going to see a result. So SEO work is super, super critical. Um, I, I pay $1,000 a month to a company right now for SEO work. Mm -hmm. I pay 500 bucks a month for Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. I pay on average $500 a month for Facebook advertisements that I boost. Um, I also have in-house a full-time, what I've deemed as a marketing person. I mm -hmm. was in the office. He was kind of doing all right, been in the company four or five years, the type of person you're not going to let go, but you realize that the capacity we're at now, she can no longer keep up. But she was a talented photographer, loved it, did it in her spare time. So we put her in a cute little car, bought her camera, and she takes pictures all day, every day of our job sites, puts them on Facebook, takes pictures of our crew, um, puts those on um, in, a, in a crew app. I mean, so I'm going to share this. I mean, this is the type of stuff we're getting from her that it's just, ah. <laughs> you know, these are, these are installers and they mean something. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but this, this goes on our Facebook pages. Um, it, are you still sharing? Oh yeah. I like this. So I'm just trying to, so she's, she's doing this piece and she's also in charge of the Facebook account. And I like to say, if you try to manage your Facebook account as an owner, it's never going to work. I don't think it's going to work. You have too many other things to do. You have too many other things going on. So you need somebody else that has ability and time to put content on their good content constantly. Uh, you're not going to be able to just put a post once a week. Hey, we, st we, we sell fence. You need to put something on it to get someone's attention. You need to put something on it and give them a reason to contact you. I find that we're putting used fence on there helps us. We, with the fence we tear out that we throw away, oftentimes put it on there and tell people you'll sell it to them for $5 a pound. Saves me from dumping it. They'll come and pick it up. But believe it or not, these people come back and buy fence from us when they realize that it's a garbage fence and it's no good. It's not going to put it in their yard anyway. So wow. being creative, I don't do, here's what I don't do radio ads. I have not done TV ads in years. I don't do print ads anymore. I don't do the phone book. I think I have a $99 uh, fee I pay for the web uh, phone book. And I think I'm in print, just my name and my number but we are no longer in a printed phone book with an ad. There's no picture ad, nothing like that. Um, so, and then yard signs, fence signs, yard signs, make sure that everybody in your team is wearing your attire and your shirt, because it's amazing. Just when they walking around town and talking to people, um, do charity events. Last night, my wife and I did a style for us. Um, we did a, a style show for the Coleman foundation. Uh -huh. and I walked a runway wearing some clothes and they just said, Mr. Fence announced it. I had a lady come up to me after the show that was trying to buy a fence from somebody else and it didn't work out. And now she's ready to go. And it was really just being out in the public and doing a charity event. And now we're going to have a sold job. So to answer his question, I don't do the traditional methods. I'm more in, uh, involved with the newer technology using social media and internet uh, SEO work. Hopefully now, do you do any lead buying, like Home Advisor or other companies that sell leads, anything like that? Done the Home Advisor, did it before it was Home Advisor. What a disaster that was and is. My office can't stand. So we currently are in a contract with Home Advisor. We're not allowed out of it, but we can turn it down to one lead, I think, uh, every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then Home Advisor has been disastrous for us. Angie's List, disastrous for us. So everything paying for lead has been awful because we get horrible leads most of the time we're getting the same lead to Mr. Fence through our marketing anyways. And now we're paying for it over here. So no, I do not do any of those pay, pay for leads. Now I will tell you on our website, we do have the ability for homeowners to go on there and measure their yard and, and get a budget price and pick out a style. So it's interactive. So we, we get that qualified lead by pushing them to our website, let them measure it up. At least they know it's going to be five to 8,000. And then if they sell the contact page, you email them back and set an appointment. Like they already know it's five, 8,000. It's not a $1,000 project. Nice. And, and direct mail. Are you doing any direct mail? So we did direct mail um, a while back and it was not successful for me at all. And the only reason why I did it is I did a, um, I built a fence for a company that does direct mail here and we traded it and we did massive direct mail. And I think my return was one appointment on a hundred, not terrible. That's about the same return you get on flyers. 
we have ran flyers um, in the past, you know, hired some kids to run them out on the weekend. But these, I don't believe flyers and direct mail is going to get you anywhere this, this day and age. I know that yep. I relate to that myself. I don't throw that stuff away. Yep. Well, uh, Jay Housewright says he spends a grand a month on AdWords, has over 85 star reviews. Um, it's not bringing in the amount of leads. And he, he, so he agrees with you. It sounds like it's a race to the bottom. Um, so I will let me, I forgot to mention that. Boy, is it so important to have uh, awesome reviews. Um, you've got to get those reviews. We are struggling to get them. We constantly fight to get them. You know, people will leave you a review when they're upset, but when they're thrilled, it's hard to get them to take the time out to put the review out there. Um, so we're starting to implement, um, policies here where we reward our crew if they get a review on Facebook. Um, so they're talking to the customer and they're asking for that review. Hey, give me a review. Um, we would love to have it. We get survey cards back all the time, but they don't really go on there. But I would tell you reviews are you lit going to live in. Once you go into the digital world and you pay to play, unfortunately uh, it's a nasty world out there. And if you get a bad review, you're going to have to do things and bend over backwards and take care of that. I had a lady that was extremely upset, gave us a one-star review uh, because she bought a fence style that didn't hold in her dog. We did exactly what we were supposed to. She was just uh, made the wrongest choice and, and blamed on us that we sold to her. So immediately within 30 minutes, I called her and, and I fixed it. I was willing, willing to tear up the fence. And she was like, what? Whatever. It, I mean, that one lead, that one one star was going to kill us. So at the end of the day, we didn't tear up the fence. We added some things to it. And, now she turned to a five-star review. So you've got to live and die by those reviews. Well said. What, now, we got a question from John Doyle. What's up, John? Uh, he's asking, what's the population in your area there, and what's your average uh, lead time from estimate to then the install? So in, we're probably about a quarter million people in Vandenberg County, um, and we operate about a 60-mile radius. So I think our touch – reaches around a 350,000 people um, that we probably reach out to. Our, the return time on the leads is so important. It's something we constantly fight. We now have three full-time estimators. Um, traditionally in the past, we've had one plus myself and my general manager. And we kind of made do, but the reality of it is I had to pull myself out of those leads, pull my general manager out of those leads so we can get to them quicker. Um, utilizing the website so they can get a quote almost immediately helps. But the turnaround time, I'd like to see, I want to see 48 hours. We're not there at this time of year. That's not happening. No matter how much I kick and scream and whine and cry, we're not at 48 hours. We're scheduling estimates a week out. Um, once we start getting the two weeks out, then I'm, I'm really um, paying attention to it and trying to find a solution. we got to do something about this. Typically, our estimators are able to run. Um, three to four leads each um, a day. They could run more, but what happens is when we, when we have them run more, the follow-up falls off mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's too much to stay in touch with that many people at one time. But continuously running three or four daily as new leads gives them time to touch back to the existing ones. Right. Um, okay, so I, I, I think we touched upon that. We do have more questions. Um, I'll, I'll take one more and then let's keep keep moving here because I want to times are going good for you you're making a lot of money but I kind of want to go into the dark times right because that's when people learn the most but uh, so we'll go over one more question here it looks like Chris and Jeff are asking the same same type of question and I think you touched upon this about uh, you've got a fencing software that is uh, doing the estimates for you pre-qualifying so right now we're, we're currently using CFS. Um, this is a whole other conversation, but we've been using that for a few years now, and that has an ability for them to, to measure the, uh, uh, as an attachment you put on your website. And it helps our crews, our salesmen, accurately, quickly measure things or uh, uh, pull out projects. But we are intimately involved with True. That's the software I was talking about recently on Facebook, mm -hmm. trying to get that platform to work for us because if it, it – once we get that trigger work, it's going to do everything from the generation lead, all the follow-up, uh, the contracts, all the work orders, all the ordering, all the timesheets, all the pictures, all every. It'll run the entire business, the scheduling, everything included. So, 
Cool. Um, maybe we can do something in the future and talk about that, but that's that's an hour long conversation. Yeah. So so that's cool. You're qualifying the leads, and I, I know what you're talking about. There's a few of them out there. There's my salesman as well, and others. Um, so that's good. Not only are you getting the leads coming in from the internet, you're then qualifying them as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Chris and Jeff. Um, so let's let's go back. Um, you mentioned starting out. You know, uh, you started as a kid basically in this business, which is incredible. Um, take us through some of the dark times and what uh, some of the challenges and life lessons you learned along the way. What one of the more recent lessons that uh, is taking me to, the longest to figure out that's been um, had the most value to me right now is that we're in the business of people. We're not in the business of fence. We're not in the fence business. It's taken me a long time to figure it out. And there's a lot of dark times and, and a lot of mistakes. And I've lost a lot of good people because I didn't realize that having the best truck and the best fence and the best tools. And if I could install it the best is not going to, it's not what is going to make you successful. But when you realize that you're in the people business, which means you need to think about how you treat people. Um, and I'm talking about not just customers, but our team members. I try to stay away from calling them employees. Um, and that's, that's something they're, they're, we're all one big team. And the moment you start thinking, living and breathing that, uh, the dynamics in your company will change. People will start doing things for the greater the team rather than themselves when you stop quantifying them as an employee or an individual and more like a team. So, I will tell you that at a young age, when I took over running the fence business, I was very cocky, very confident that I could build a fence. And back then, I told, I would tell you I'd build a fence better than anybody. <laughs> if you don't know a fence guy that's not egotistical and believes he can build better than anybody, I mean, he's not a real fence guy. So, <laughs> I'm brutally honest, guys, I thought I had everything figured out. I was at the time, uh, I possibly the youngest CFP in U.S. history. I think I got it at 18. Tony Thornton, I think, is the only one that's close to that. We're still debating on who actually was the youngest at the time, but super confident. Well, I treated people like shit. Mm -hmm. I literally would wear them out and get another person. If they couldn't keep up with me, no big deal. I get another one. Uh, and this went on for a long time. And I thought I would was treating people better, um, you know, in the late 2000s and but the reality of it is I never really thought once you start training how you think about people as a team and investing into your people is when it changes. So what I mean by investing is help teach and train. And sometimes that costs you money, a lot of money, but it also costs you a lot of money when you don't teach and train and the mistakes keep happening and you lose money on a job site. Somebody said recently, well, if you teach everybody everything, you know, and they leave and go work for your competition, that, oh my gosh, well, that's happened multiple times, but I like to tell them, what if I don't teach them anything and they stay? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to have a continuous problem of mistakes over and over and over. So some of the darkest times was I look back and I'm embarrassed of how I treated some of our team members back then um, as if they were just um, insignificant in the bigger picture. And I think that that is something here recently we do. We, we hire a motivational speaker to come in um, uh, several times a year. We have, we have a financial advisor to have classes with our, with our team members outside of me even being around it. We pay them to go to it. So they learn how to become wealthier and, and manage their money better. Um, we, you know, this, this leads me to, I might as well talk about it. I want to share it. Um, we, when you start looking at people as team members and being one of your biggest assets in your company, Mm -hmm. you've got to maintain and take care of that asset. It's like having a piece of equipment. If you never oil it or take care of it and maintain it, it's going to wear out and not be worth anything. So people are the same way. And we look at our team members like athletes. So we looked, we started in November, October from November, we started buying lunches for all of our team members every day. We pay for it. And at first, when I first thought of this idea, it was, it was, it was on the premise that I'm tired of driving our trucks to go and eat lunch and we have fuel and maintenance and downtime and we need to be more productive, get this job done in one day. But the reality of it is I, I, I met with a small company and they are a food like prep company for athletes. And so mm -hmm. they make meal prep plans. Well, 
my asked her to do me some samples, brought them into the company meeting. Everybody loved them, how they tasted. I was able to get them down to like $6 a meal. But these are nutritional meals. It's the best meal that my team members probably going to eat all day. And if we put garbage in, they go eat cheeseburgers and crap food and then expect them to perform all day long, work in the heat or work in the cold or pack material, they, they're going to they're gonna be less efficient um, and, and, and less um, well. So by providing I food. I love that. So, yeah, feed them healthy and a healthy lot. Yeah, that's awesome. It shows them that they're important, right? Because, I mean, some people look at it and say, why would you spend $6 an employee and we're paying them to eat the meal? What? But they're not, they're, we're saving so much money by not having the trucks drive to lunch, by not having a downtime of an hour of clean up and prep time. By that little bit of time, let's get that job done, get to the next job. And then it, it's a perk. Someone will probably ask us, you know, how do you find good people? Well, when you find them, you better hold on to them. And if you hold on to those good people, they're going to start bragging to people they know. I think some of our best uh, team members that we have have come from somebody that knows somebody that currently works with us. So when they are talking in a group of friends, like, yeah, I work for a company. We have, we have attendance bonuses and we have lunches catered to us every day and our, and we have outings and we have motivational speakers. They start talking about the total package. All of a sudden you start attracting better people. Um, but it's a vicious, uh, it's scary. Let me tell you that you have to be willing to take the risk and put up the money first it's almost backwards what most people, what I thought in the beginning was um, just for instance, if you have an employee, uh, a team member that wants to be a foreman, you tell them, well, when you start doing foreman duties, you start performing like a foreman. And when you, you learn everything, I'll give you the money. I'll give you the reps. Well, this is kind of like giving it to them first and it's theirs to lose. Um, mm -hmm. So we typically now we're spending the money for the lunches. We're taking that risk. We're, we're putting the money into these benefit packages. We're putting money into people and we're taking the risk that, yeah, it might not work out for us, but if it does, we've now earned that respect for that for that person, have the opportunity to keep them on and get more uh, qualified or or higher caliber coworkers to come uh, and want to join our team. Um, so, but giving back to your team, giving back to your people, that's huge. I think it's more important than any truck and any tool or any lead generation you could possibly do mm -hmm. is taking care of the core people in your company because. They're, they, they are what's going to have to make it happen, especially if you get out of the driver's seat and start driving a remote control car. You need good team members to run it so you can get out I, of the company. I, I had someone, I think, in your Facebook group just the other day. I, maybe it was your, I think so. But um, And we're going to give that to people for those that don't know about your Facebook group. We'll talk about that. Um, but are you doing any – they asked me about profit sharing. Are you doing anything like that to we encourage long-term – Yep. Every year we do a profit, we have a, have a profit sharing schedule set out. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in the company has to make profit as a business owner. You need to be selling projects, making profit. Um, and then talk about that profit with everybody, even your cohort, even your team. And so we share that information and then we redistribute a, a small portion of it, the profit sharing at the end of the year um, as a little bonus to them. So there is a structure there we have, and we're talking, you know, laborers might get a hundred bucks and uh, management might get a couple thousand dollars, right? Um, at the end of the year. I mean, it, there's that, it's not an astronomical amount of money, but it's a little bit and it's around Christmas time and it helps everybody out. Um, we also give an attendance bonus. I don't know about you guys on here, but one of the biggest battles we have with people in our company is people showing up work on time, not calling in sick, uh, not leaving early. So it goes back to the meals. If, if people are more are, are well, they're going to call in sick less. So by feeding them better every day, we've actually had less people puking in sick and calling in because they don't feel well. Because they're eating better food. Um, I have a little bit of background in CrossFit and nutrition. I'm a CrossFit instructor, um, level two certified. So I know what it's like to be to be well and fit. And I want my, everyone else to feel that way. But the point being, we have an attendance bonus program. Like I said earlier, give everybody. We give it up front. It's there's a loop. So it's 50 cents an hour bonus. If for every quarter, for every hour you work in a quarter that you don't call in sick and you don't show up late, 50 mm -hmm. cents an hour. And it actually grows. So the first quarter, if you do that, you get 50 cents an hour as a bonus on your last check in the quarter for all the hours work. Second quarter, the same way. Well, the third quarter goes to 75 cents mm -hmm. if you made all three quarters. And if you go all year, 
you get a dollar an hour bonus uh, on the last quarter because you made it all year. But we're giving it to them up front, right? They're telling us there's to lose. Um, Very nice. But, yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do, I have uh, just a couple more questions for you. I do want to keep this on time for you. And um, what do you think, guys? I mean, type in the chat box. Is this helping? I, I, how do you how do you feel? I, I think you're giving awesome information, Sean. And I, but I want to hear from you guys. How do you feel about this so far? So many things I could talk about for hours. It looks like I'm barely touching on stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, seeing the questions. I guess I uh, I should pull that up. I haven't looked at that. Um, I want to ask you about your systems because. You, you know, you did mention a lot of these guys. Um, it's so important for growing to have your systems in place. Can you so kind of share with? So it's super, super critical. Um, we've learned that rapid growth alone, or even the volume, if you don't have systems and procedures for almost everything, you're setting yourself up for a lot of disasters, or you're going to be a full-time firefighter putting out fires all day long. So we do have um, systems for installing fence. Obviously, that's my bread and butter, and, and, and I, I'm over the top with how to pack out two-by-fours and how to lay them on the ground and, and how to run pickets. And I mean, just over the top of these methods. We actually have a – it's like a 25-page um, test that it talks about every one of our procedures on how to install fence. We've also got procedures and job descriptions for everything in-house as far as the process of procedures. And we, we make it very important to follow those. You make it important that this is the procedure. This is the protocol. This is what we expect. You know, our estimators have to turn in pre-pictures. They have to flag it. They have to check. There's the laundry list of things they have to turn in before it's even counted as a sole job. So what? You got to check in a contract. There's about 15 other things you got to have completed before we kinda, we're going to count it. Um, so systems and procedures – are huge communication. I'm gonna share with you guys a tip right now um, that has been a game changer for communication. Our company is it's an app. It's an app called Crew. C R E W. It is free. Crew. If you've never heard of this, check it out. You're gonna to want to use it. We use it for every one of our businesses across the board and every um, division in our company. So what it is, it's like group text. Uh, we all know how awful group text can be, especially on different platforms, uh, Androids and iPhones alone. But Crew allows us, we have a Crew um, chat discussion for crew for the installation team, for our maintenance crew. Uh, there it is. Um, and it's free. Like, it doesn't cost anything. We have it for our sales team. We have it for our management team. We have it for our HR team. So you get to pick who's in those groups. And, it, and so um, – you can post a question. I'm able to see communication through all groups. I can see that yesterday someone had a front rotor brake grab it on the 650 and it was in the maintenance crew. So our maintenance guy saw it, but I saw it as well. Like I didn't have to talk to anybody or go read a report. Uh, Information is live. Um, our installation teams have to put pictures up at 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. with a status update of what the project, uh, how it's going, what's going on the project. So it allows us to schedule and move manpower and get things done. Our sales team, every single time there's a sale, they got to put pictures on crew of, this, of the uh, sale and the description of the sale. So it's live, interactive. We all know. Everyone knows the moment something happens, your, thing, your phone will ding, and you look at which crew that, that is, that information is critical. Communication is super critical. We can send a message out to everybody at once. I know today it's raining. Uh, guys are soaking wet. They're muddy. They're trying to work through the process, get their jobs done. I sent a message out to all the installation team and I told them, I said, I want to see your best crew muddy wet photograph of your team now. And the person with the best, the crew with the best one gets a gold star. The crew lets you give gold stars away. So we give gold stars that were $15. Um, so we've got some, some interactive photos, but what really happened guys, I got their mind off the, the, where they're working at. They made it fun for a minute, started smiling, even though they're muddy and wet and they're tired and they're cold took pictures, the whole team did it, everybody support, even the office took pictures and put black paint under their eyes. And you know, that's the type of camaraderie and team building that crew can bring to you. Uh, communication, it's, it's priceless. It's that's great. awesome. I, I love that. Very good. So uh, we got a, a, and by the way, uh, Chris Steele says, Sean, that you've gone out of your way to help him many times. 
uh, from introducing him to uh, the AFA and just answering his questions. He's uh, saying thanks for sharing. Yes. Um, and then we got a couple more questions. And before I get to those, Sean, um, and then we're going to be probably right at time after that. Uh, what other nuggets of wisdom would you share with the folks today? Ah, uh, um, here's what I, your business, what you do six to five, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. is the price you pay to play. What you do from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. is going to determine whether you're successful at playing this game or not. I really, really honestly believe that. I fight with my wife and my loved ones about it all the time. I have four kids. You can see the picture of my family above my head. Uh, and it's a constant battle. But that 5 to 11 doesn't mean you got to be at your desk. Uh, but it means that if you're driving down the road or if you're sitting there, I, I don't watch TV. There's no time for TV. That's out of the question. But if I have a little downtime, I'm thinking, brainstorming, coming up with ideas, um, like everything I'm talking about, the meals, that came from hours and hours of thinking through the problem. I got sick people. I got broke down trucks. I need to get more productivity. How am I going to do this? Thinking through those situations. I just, you don't, as a business owner, you don't have the right to go home and turn it off. You, if that's what you want to do, go work for somebody else. Um, it's not going to work. You know, um, entrepreneurs, they're, they're the person that's willing to work 100 hours in a week just so they don't have to work 40 for somebody else. You're not going to be an entrepreneur and work 50 hours a week. It's never going to happen. So if we give someone a nugget, is this is a this is a grind every day. Get up and grind. There's not a day off. There's you're you need to be dedicated day in day out. You know, typically a day for me on a typical day. Right now it's a little mixed up, but typical day it's start at 4:30 in the morning, hitting the gym, um, teaching a CrossFit class, hitting uh, the office by 6 a.m. Get my kids, take them to. Uh, at the office at 6 a.m. And then I work as a deputy sheriff, uh, second shift, full time, um, 2 to 10, um, four days on, two days off. So I get home 10, 30, 11 o'clock, my two days off at the sheriff's office. I try to get home at 5 o'clock to be with the wife for two nights a week and the kids. But this is a grind. Um, if I give you guys a nugget, it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. So be prepared for uh, relentlessly grinding over and over and over. Yeah. All right. Well said. Uh, John Doyle says he's selling, estimating, and building everything on his own right now. He's solo. So the value for me is to help inform my vision of what um, – oh, he's, he's talking about you. The value he's getting is from the vision of what uh, growing this company will look like. And the, uh, the bit about investing in my team members hit home for sure. Thank you, he says. It's huge. And how uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you, it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we're, we're about at time. I'm going to leave it up to the, uh, the people here that have joined us. Any questions, last questions you want to ask, we've got, uh, please send them in now. Uh, Josh Penn says, how many installers, office people do you have when you decided you could not be hands-on in the field any longer? So, right, that's back when uh, we were at that $900,000 mark, right? We were actually running, I think, three three-man crew and two people in the office um, and one salesman at that time. I think that's what he's asking, where we were before we grew to where we are now. Um, and now we have three salesmen, uh, three people in the office, myself, business coach, general manager. Um, I said two, three people in the shop. And then the five teams that we're bringing on, hopefully the, to the sixth team here real soon of three people, quite a few people. And then we also have a little bit of synergy between, I own another company called Unique Escapes, is outdoor living spaces. So there's a lot of synergy between those two companies. It's a landscaping and hardscaping. We do the uh, outdoor kitchens and putting greens and waterfalls and fire pits and fireplaces and pools. So we're getting in those backyards We're we're, we're trading, you know, the customers buying fence from us and landscape from them or vice versa. But we also have a pool of another 20 to 30 men, men over there that we can pull from on a large project if we, if we needed manpower. We had that access to us. But to answer this question back then, um, we were pretty lean. Okay. Um, and now we have a question from uh, Josh, Joshua Glover. Does it help to report things on a public platform? Does what gets reported improve? 
So you wonder where that came from. Josh is a general manager at Mr. Fence. He must have joined the party late. Uh, but that, I'm glad Josh said that because Josh lives and dies by the same thing. I mean, I, what gets measured improves and what gets measured and reported improves exponentially. So, like, I know we'll have a few minutes left. I was going to show you guys what I mean by reported. I'm talking about Excel sheets for about everything in your company. You need, you need to be keeping track of those, but you also need to be keeping track of reporting successes and failures in the company with your team members. So before I show this, what Josh is talking about, like the crew app, if we have a crew that makes a mistake on the job site, rather than rectifying that with that one crew and that knowledge dies there, we share it on the crew app with everybody, not in a way to embarrass them, but like we learned this today, this is what, what happened, and try to prevent it from happening everywhere else. This sheet I'm gonna put up on the screen right now, I don't think it's not for you guys to read necessarily because the numbers are all squashed up. And, but this is what I do. This is my yearly budget planning um, and it's live and interactive. I've been doing this now for 10 years. When you talk about what gets measured and reported, it ex improves exponentially. This sheet has every single expense category that we have and um, every income category that we have, every truck, everything's labeled, everything's separated. And it's, it's broke out by month. And then it's broke out by, at the bottom, comparison for years. So there's 2010 and 2019 in there. Um, it gives me my average gross revenue per month. It gives me a number of working days on average per month based on rain and holidays. Um, and so we're able to plan and forecast the growth. And so you can put in here your margins and uh, that you need on your material, um, put your labor percentages in here, and it just it's going to put your overhead in here. It tells you where your gross revenue needs to be. Um, to make your goals and your percentages uh, where they need to be. So, you know, Josh is intimately involved with the markups and margins in our company. Mm -hmm. Talk about this earlier. Whole slide point, uh, PowerPoint presentation on markups versus margins, and a lot of people mix those two up. Um, but when you sell a project or talk to somebody about selling a project, you need to design, develop, you need to plan for profit. And most fence contractors I talk to say, I've covered all my costs. I can do it for $5,600. That's great. Mm -hmm. How much money so, and we need to talk about that in percentage, not this, well, I'll make 200 bucks or 500 bucks. You no, know, put in percentage. So for us, we talk about four buckets in our business. Everything falls into four buckets, no matter what. You have material, you have labor, the cost of goods, that's above the gross profit line. So material labor, then you have overhead below that's an expense, and then you have net profit. That's four buckets. So if I have somebody that's selling something and they know what the material cost is, and they don't know the other three, the material costs in our business on a certain type of product should be 38%. They can divide that by 0.38 and get the total sale of the job done. Or they know what the labor portion is, or they know that you can work it out backwards. But at the end of the day, every dollar comes in, it's going to be separated in those four buckets to keep it simple. Everything separated in four buckets. So like Josh said, everything measured, we're, we're calculating those continuously as we grow our company. As we add more benefits, we add more expense on our overhead, which changes our overhead costs. Go back to that budget sheet, which changes my sale price for my projects. As, we're, as our labor or as our maintenance comes down and our fuels comes down, our overhead comes down, mm -hmm. we can be live and interactive and change our pricing. Awesome. Well, listen, um, we're just about on time. So what I want to do is end with um, your Facebook group, because I think that's really cool. And this will help people. Uh, so let me go ahead and share that real quick with everybody. So this is um, a Facebook group Josh and I started. Um, we have, I think, several hundred um, members in there. It's a closed group. It's not open to the public. Um, we're not awful selective about who's in this group. Basically, if you're in the fence business, we'd like to have you in this group. Um, and, and so the name of it is the Fence Professionals Network, right? Yes. Okay, so they can go on Facebook and just search the Fence Professionals Network group. It'll pop right up. And um, they can go there and get a lot of value from other fence company owners and yourself about running their business. We have some very sharp... Uh, people on that on that site right now. Um, uh, I'm I'm mainly the one putting the live video feeds up, um, foolishly putting myself out on Front Street. But I am willing right now to share about everything that I can. Um, I've had a lot of help over the years. I wouldn't be where I am right now if people wouldn't help me out and share information. So uh, 
I'm at a point now like it's it's not I'm not trying to protect this information. If I've got something to help somebody out, I'm gonna share it. Like Chris Steele said, um, I met him. Um, I've, I've done everything I can to help him out, and I know that if I needed something, Chris would take care of me in a heartbeat. So it's just about building those relationships. We're all in the same battle. We're all fighting the same war in the defense industry, and we need to start helping each other out. There's people on our page that have some knowledge that would help out so everybody. And we got to give them a platform to share that. Some of the best ideas are, ju are just stuck in a, in a small town or a small company or a single guy or a single shop that can help us tremendously. Well, it's, it's – we all need to share. We all need to invest in that. We all need to share. So I'm going to continue putting videos up of what we do and our successes and our failures um, and our growth. And I would and love for everyone else to participate. And let's, let's, let's build a valuable page where we can all share more information. Awesome. And on that note, I think we can go ahead and clump, uh, come to a close. Sean, you did an awesome job. This was incredible knowledge. Uh, Mr. Fence, everybody. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time with this. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I guess they can reach out to you in your group. On the group, I have a, also my Facebook page is Sean Stravinska's King. Uh, personal page, you're welcome to send me messenger messages on that as well. So good luck. Awesome. Here. All right. Well, thank you so much. Take care. And thanks for joining us, folks. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.